Uh, greetings. So my name is Stacy Allison Casson. I'm an assistant professor uh, at the Faculty of Information, at the University of Toronto, where I teach um, in the Library and Information Studies stream. Um, I'm on leave from my position as an associate librarian at York University, also in uh, Toronto. Um, and uh, I am involved in several uh, associations, um, including um, IFLA. Uh, where I am the chair of the Indigenous Matters section. Um, so to start off, I want to talk a little bit about the benefits of Open Glam. And when we talk about Open Glam, of course, we mean things like open access, um, open licensing, um, sh sharing uh, materials for reuse. But before we get into this, I just want to foreground this conversation by saying when we talk about Open Glam, we also need to um, ensure that we're thinking about um, or being aware that not all materials um, necessarily should be open. So this is, this is um, in consideration, for example, of things like Indigenous knowledge um, or knowledge that might be special or specific to communities. And we need to make sure when we talk about um, issues like open glam that we are keeping this in mind as well and um, uh, making sure we look at things like the care principle. So this is uh, care stands for collective benefit, authority to control responsibility and ethics um, when we go about our work. So I did want to foreground that in this um, conversation. Um, and when we talk about those who steward collections, so we're talking about librarians or working in archives or museums or other kinds of um, spaces, um, I like to think about it as having sort of three different ways that we go about our work. So one is, is acquiring collections um, and then stewarding collections. So that's um, being mindful of things like um, preservation or how we keep things uh, for the long term, um, but also how we make things accessible to people who want to use them. And so when we talk about Open Glam, I think it's especially important to talk about that latter piece. So how we make um, collections available for use for uh, people to interact with and um, and to think about what is what is the point of collections if we're not doing that work of ensuring that there is some um, access to those collections. So we know that some of the benefits of open glam are making collections more accessible, making them reusable. So for example, um, being able to integrate uh, materials into teaching um, more easily or into um, uh, different kinds of research projects. And I also want to stress, I think, that some of the importance of open glam work, so making materials more accessible, more findable, more reusable, is that we don't always know when we work in glam organizations how someone might um, relate to a item in our collection or a collection of items. Um, and there may be things that they want to do with them that we're not aware of. So for example, um, someone doing research on family history may have a different kind of relationship with a photograph of a building than um, someone who doesn't have that kind of relationship. And when we make collections more available, so for example, um, making them available through something like Wikimedia Commons or other kinds of uh, common searches, it means that those people doing some of that family research will might be able to find those um, photographs. And it would be harder for them to find those photographs if we are keeping them siloed or separate in um, individual collections. So for me, one of the biggest benefits of um, open access or open glam is really thinking about how we ensure our collections stay um, vital and that they and and that vitality comes through uh, use and meaningful interactions with those collections. When we talk about barriers to open glam, there's a few that come to mind. And this first one I'll mention, but I do think that, or I hope that this is changing um, somewhat. 
but that sometimes there's a feeling that making things openly available is harmful or will negatively impact the the business, so to speak, of the GLAM organization. That part of the value of GLAM organizations comes from the stewarding or the holding of unique collections. And that if we open up those collections for sort of unfettered reuse, that our value as an organization might be reduced. But I don't think this is the case because the more something is open, the more um, interactions people have with your organization. Um, and the other problem is, is that when we keep things um, hidden or sort of behind um, barriers, um, so that those barriers can be in the form of licenses, um, or can be sort of hidden away on, on smaller uh, organizations websites, then again, we um, don't have that interaction that we might need. And I think part of the barriers too come from issues around things like grants or the consideration of collections being equated with a kind of capital and that your capital, and by this, I mean, the value invested in your collections is somehow harmed by making those collections more available for reuse. And I think that attitude needs to change. And that also goes beyond the um, GLAM organization itself. So we also have to think about the impacts um, on things like granting organizations. Are grants connected with this idea of unique and specialized and um, um, the way that that capital is sort of bound up with collections. So there's barriers that, like on multiple levels. And I think some of those barriers do come with a way that we think about how value is invested in collections. Another barrier I want to mention is that um, resources. So it could very well be that uh, or an organization might want to make their collection more available through um, digitization projects, um, through repositories or websites, but we know that resources are really uh, a huge challenge and resources aren't just um, money, but their time, um, human resources, so people, um, and also knowledge. So it could be that you might want to make something accessible or participate in Open Glam initiatives, but you lack the um, the knowledge at your institution to be able to um, understand how to use something like Creative Commons licenses, how to integrate licensing within a repository, or how to apply appropriate metadata to ensure that um, you have appropriate licenses on your materials. So I think um, to me, a huge barrier is that resource um, um, part. Uh, we know that it is relatively easy and cheap even in some ways to digitize, but it is much, much more resource intensive to apply appropriate metadata, uh, to provide staff training, um, and to have those um, people on hand who can do the work of, uh, of that, um, uh, of those initiatives. Um, and the last point I wanted to make about that too, because we also uh, know that collections need to be maintained, digital collections beyond uh, the life, for example, of a grant. And so how do we think about preservation and access in the long term? And I think that's another um, barrier that we need to consider. So how I got interested in, um, in Open Glam or in Open Movements, and I think um, a story that I like to relate about this is actually way back in the beginning of my professional career, I worked at a not-for-profit institution that was very small, um, focused on post-1950s art music in Canada, uh, and its members were composers, and the whole point of the organization really was to get um, music of these composers into the hands of performers so that it could be performed and known. And one day, um, one of the composers uh, came in and he was quite um, elderly and he actually passed away not too long after this, um, this conversation I had with him. And he was very upset because he could not, um, he had his music published uh, with a publisher 
uh, that publisher disappeared. They actually could not track down the person, the people who were the, the owners of this, of this uh, corporation. Um, but he could not retrieve the copyright for his music. So he, the music was out of print. The, the publishers had disappeared and um, he wanted his, his music to be played, to be reprinted, and he couldn't because of these restrictions of, of copyright. Um, and I just, you know, that story really stuck with me because, you know, oftentimes we think about publishing as being um, a good thing. It's like the pinnacle of success. You have something published. Um, but it, it really caused a lot of... Um, I would say almost, you know, harm really. And so it really got me thinking about, about intellectual property differently, about what it means for something to be accessible and how we can ensure when we talk about cultural heritage, because this again was talking about Canadian uh, cultural content, Canadian music, that was, is really a very small, um, small area. And how do we ensure that that we have long-term uh, accessibility to cultural materials and, and really focusing on thinking about licensing as being particularly important in that context. And also making sure that people who are creators have knowledge of uh, licensing as something that they should pay attention to. So it can be something um, open glam I think is a real challenge in some ways. I was just talking about uh, or mentioning um, this conversation with uh, uh, creators. And I think sometimes there's friction points between um, how people working in GLAM organizations, librarians, archivists, curators, want materials to potentially be more accessible. And then the challenge is both from the point of creators potentially or from um, administrators because we know that information um, has value. Information is a form of, of capital. And, um, but again, I think I wanna urge people to consider that we want cultural materials to, to be living, to have, to have life, to be, to be used and interacted with. And, um, and there's so many amazing things that can happen when we allow things to circulate more, more freely and to think about how we can impact uh, the world beyond our individual um, organizational websites, for example, and what, can happen if we open up our materials more widely to allow them, for example, to be integrated into other uh, repositories, into research projects, um, and have uh, have this life beyond. So that would be my my last urging is to really think about maximizing um, impacts well beyond the bounds of your individual um, organization. Thank you.